This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today, we are honored to have in the studio State Representative Pat Fallon, who is also the Republican nominee to be the next senator for Senate District 30, which covers 14 counties across North Texas. Correct. So, Pat, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Trey. Appreciate it. Well, I suspect that our listeners right now think, given your position as a state representative and soon to be senator, that we're going to talk about transportation funding, uh, school finance reform, property tax reform. All very important topics. All, all yeah. very, very important topics and subjects. However, what we're actually here to talk about is the fact that I think you are completely insane. Yeah. And my wife, too. So <laughs> This is going comment. to be a full-blown Dr. Phil-style intervention. So sorry <laughs> to pit throw that at you right now, but that's what we're going to do. Um, well, all kidding aside, actually what we're here to talk about is an absolutely amazing story, uh, the details of which I heard for the first time uh, when we were having lunch here a couple months ago. Um, and, you know, that day you brought everyone in my office to tears telling the story. So that's what I want to focus on. But before we do that, let's, let's talk about some basics. Tell, sure. us, tell us where you were born and raised. Uh, well, I said on the campaign trail a lot, I'd be asked that in uh, rural Texas. And I said, I'm from a small town just northeast of Dallas called Pittsfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, grew up there in a rural area. My right. parents are retired school teachers right. and went to the University of Massachusetts my freshman year, primarily because I did not gain admission to the school of, of my choice, which was the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. Right. But uh, did, I did was able to transfer to Notre Dame. I was an ROTC cadet and also um, joined the varsity football team under legendary coach Lou Holtz, right. who had got lovely and funny stories about. And maybe we could do an, I could do a whole podcast. We'll just do an on encore coach, about Lou yeah, Holtz. Coach yeah, Holtz. Okay, we'll do and that I'll do for my sure. impressions. <laughs> I just don't well, show. Hold don't, on. Yeah. Give us, well, let me say. Chris Lock, I'm going to tell you something, son. Do not show Coach Holtz my impression of Coach Holtz. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he's probably going to see this podcast. Yeah. So, um, you were on the 1988 championship football team under, under Coach Lou Holtz. We just had our 30th reunion on Labor Day weekend over in South Bend when we thrashed Michigan, largely right. due to my presence. I'm sure. I'm yes. sure it was the inspiration. Because I inspired them. That's right. Yes. Kind of Rudy style, huh? <laughs> yeah. And I saw Rudy, too. You know, I was Rudy's business manager for two years. It, well, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, after the movie came out, TriStar Pictures released it in October of 93. And uh, from 90, beginning of 94 to 96, I was his business manager and went on the road with him. It was a great experience. That's amazing. Yeah. What position did you play on that team? My wife says left out. <laughs> left out. Yeah. Uh, Ru- She's Ru- into Rudy, puns. Ru- Rudy could relate. <laughs> yeah, <huh>? right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a receiver. Okay. And we, had, we were so stacked and loaded because we won the national championship my junior year. We uh, lost only one game my senior year. We went 12-1 and one and came. We were uh, second in the polls to Miami that next year. Right. And Dorsey Levins was our, our tailback, fourth string tailback, and had to – he gained over 10,000 yards in the NFL. He had to transfer to Georgia Tech to get playing time. Oh, wow. That's just – we were just loaded. Right. Tim Brown was right. a receiver, won the Heisman Trophy. Ricky Waters, a flanker, you know, of NFL fame. Right. So they well, were way better than me. It's, it's Notre Dame and it's Lou Holtz, so I can only imagine the talent on that team. Because I believe in full disclosure, they were a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so after your famed football career at yeah. Notre Dame, you went on to become an officer in the Air Force. You yes. were stationed. I, I got to just do one Lou Holtz because this will sum up my college okay. playing career. He, I, I've been able to introduce him about five times at, at various events. And at, up in Cleveland at the Republican National Convention right. at a pro-life luncheon, I introduced him, about 1,000 people there. And he came, walked up, and he said, Pat, thank you so much. I, listen, before we get started, folks, I just got to tell you a little bit something about Pat Fallon. He was a great teammate, wonderful football player, so reliable, hardworking, that every time I saw him on the field, I knew we were going to win the game. Of course, I wouldn't put his ass in unless we were up by 30. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. So. Nice, yeah. nice. I'm sure you appreciated that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so Air Force, you were stationed at Shepherd Air Shepherd Force, Air Force Base, Wichita, Wichita Falls. Falls, Texas, great city. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That happens to be now in Senate District 30. Correct. Who would have thought? 
Who would have thought? Who would have thunk it? Yeah. Uh, you uh, went on after the Air Force to start a successful entrepreneurial career, uh, and now have a a yeah. lovely wife and, and two wonderful boys. Yes. Uh, yeah. And are serving your third term as a state representative yes, in the Texas yeah. House. These are definitely the good old days. I think that we all <laughs> need to understand that we're blessed, and to think about uh, thirty years from now looking back fondly on these years and savoring every moment. So, you know, Absolutely. every every time I just do even something mundane with my children, I think these are the good old days. How so, old are your sons? 12 and 9. Right. So yeah, before you know ages. it, they'll be out of the house and yeah. savor every mo- moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. In a few years, everything I do will be wrong while right now it's <laughs> right. Yeah. You're still the hero. <laughs> yeah, right. You're still the hero. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about on this show mainly is the fact that you competed in a race where you ran seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. Yes, sir. Yeah. Why would you do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the World Marathon Challenge is something I wasn't aware existed. Right. And it, two mutual exclusive events kind of converged. So in the summer of 2015, uh, my family was on vacation with another family, and I was having lunch with the dad and we were watching ESPN, um, just uh, chewing the fat. And there's peace came on about the World Marathon Challenge where right. competitors run seven marathons, seven days and seven continents within 168 hours. And mm. our reactions were starkly different. I thought, wow, what an amazing adventure to be able to do that. And uh, my, my buddy goes, oh, it sounds awful, miserable. Like, what are you talking about? You run a marathon, well, what's that take, like four hours? And then you can go out and see the sights. And right. he goes, he just stops to me. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You do realize that it's 26.2 miles. You are not going to be running that in four hours. Right. Now, I'm a, not a runner. Probably ran three, four, five Ks my entire life. Sure. At the time, I'm 235 pounds, you know, 47 years old. That's just, that's not going to happen. Right. And he said, I bet you you can't even run one marathon or one mile. One mile. In nine minutes. So we made <laughs> bet. We, you know, we bet dinner. We made a bet. And I bought dinner. Oh, wow. So it, anyway, it, it put it in perspective for me a little bit, but it just fades into the memory, into the background. So hold, yeah. hold on. I've got the statistics here just so everybody has a full appreciation okay. for what this race is. 26.2 miles per marathon, 183.4 miles total, Yep. 30,000 miles of air travel because you have to fly to each of these seven continents, That's correct. right? Temperatures that would range anywhere from minus four degrees to high 70s, low 80s in Australia where you ended, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And each marathon had an eight-hour time on it. Correct. And when you sleep, I didn't know this at the time, but you're probably going to sleep about 18 total hours for the week, which, you know, so you're sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. And the nutrition's tough because you're in airports. And some airports and some other countries don't realize that people need something called food. Right. And they don't sell it. Not even a snicker bar. It was, yeah, it's, it was bizarre. <laughs> that was, I didn't know any of that when I started. But. Right. So during 2015, you know, it faded in memory, and there was a little boy named Johnny Wade who developed cancer, and he lives in Illinois. And it kept showing up on my uh, Facebook feed because a, a friend and neighbor of mine know, knew the family. And I never read, and I'm ashamed to admit it now, but I never read one of the posts hmm. because it hit too close to home. At that time, I had, my sons were nine and six. This little boy was diagnosed at seven and was eight during 2015. And I thought to myself, why would I want to read that? It's just tragedy. I don't know the family. I'm not a wealthy uh, you know, philanthropist. Mm-hmm. I'm not a scientific researcher. I'm not a medical doctor. What could I possibly do to help this family? It's just sad, scurry past, ostrich, head in sand. Right. And then one night, uh, it was October 16th. I was about to go to bed. I hit my news feed and I saw another you know, post about Johnny. And I don't know why, but I read it. And it just, it just moved me and it moved my, uh, to, the, to my core. Mm. You know? Anyway, so the, the post was about his mother. This little boy started out at 49 pounds, healthy, beaming, right. was diagnosed with cancer on Christmas Day, 2014. Mm. And then given uh, the melloblastoma that he had, it has about a 5% survivability for one year. So the odds are stacked against him. He goes from 49 pounds and healthy to 29 pounds. I mean, that literally a shadow on a shell of his former self. 
and then in October after enduring radiation treatments and chemotherapy, and then the pain that's involved in that, mm -hmm. and going from a carefree seven-year-old to an eight-year-old fighting for his life. His mother asked him one question. She said, Johnny, if you could have one wish, what would it be? And I think the listeners and you or me would knee-jerk and say, I want to get better. Because right. that's what I would answer. Oh, sure. And he didn't. He answered. He said, Mommy, I just pray that no other kid ever gets cancer. Mm. And then you just get so moved by that. And you say, well, I, now I'm, I, I want to do whatever I can to help this family. What could I possibly do? Again, I don't know them. And I'm not somebody that can help medically. Right. And I prayed on it. And for some odd reason, that World Marathon Challenge thing from six months prior or three months prior popped into my head. And I said, wait a minute. What if somebody like me did something like that? And it would get a lot of attention and I could raise a lot of money for pediatric cancer sure. research. And also give Johnny and his brother, he has a twin brother, Jackie, right. give those little boys a distraction because little boys like adventure and a globe and where are, you know. Sure. I thought, this, this is perfect. I've got a plan. So I got excited. I went downstairs the next day. I tell my wife at breakfast, this is what I'd love to do. And she says, no. <laughs> of course she did. Because it's insane. Right. And she, she actually said, I said, why? I was indignant. I go, why? She goes, because it's impossible. Well, yeah, that's fair. And you're going to die. Oh. Mm. And I said, well, well, I can do it. She thought I was going to have a heart attack, get organ failure. Because you're old. Oh, yeah, crinkety, <laughs> circle in the drain, one foot in the grave. So, uh, and not to be deterred, that night, I, I, I called friends. I said, same reaction as my wife. You're nuts. You're going to die. Don't do it. All right. Because um, you start in Antarctica. Mm. Yeah. And even going to Antarctica is a challenge and adventure in and of itself, right. at getting there. But then to run a marathon while you're there is a little bit nutty. Sure. And so the next day, th that I came up with a 33-page PowerPoint presentation <laughs> and showed my wife why this would be a wonderful thing for the Wade family, for Johnny, for our family, for Texas, you know, and for our boys to, to teach them the value of working hard and trying to achieve a goal. Sure. And she smiled and she said, yes. But she said, yes, not so you can have live some midlife crisis and live some <laughs> adventure. You better do this. And if you do, it's for this little boy. Right. And if you do it for him, then I'll let you do it. Because she had been reading the posts all mm. year. Oh, wow. She knew precisely who Johnny Wade was. And she had, you know, buy-in completely to doing whatever was possible to mitigate his pain. Sure. And to help him along his journey. So I said, done. She said, one other condition. And I said, what? Anything. I'm ready to go now. i got to figure out how to do all this. She goes, you need to update your will. <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny so yeah. i have to first of all call richard donovan who runs the world marathon challenge to see if i can even do this there's only 15 spots at that time they're 15 spots a year okay and i call and this is all kind of it seems i guess the non-believer would say these are all coincidences right i'd like to think of them as all god winks because sure. there's just a series of events that had to fall into place perfectly for this to even be possible right one of which was i needed space he said well you're in luck he's an irish guy you know i said stop pot I tell you what, you're in luck. He's read 15, it was all filled, but one fella just dropped out. So do you want slot the spot or not? And I said, well, Richard, yeah. Uh, can you hold it and give me 24 hours? I just have to confirm with right. my wife one last time. He goes, right. I've heard that before. Sure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he didn't expect a call back right, right at that know? point. So we got the call back, and, and we, so we can do it. And then I have to train. And I had 85 days. Oh. That's yeah. it. Yeah, it's not a long time. No, and you have to, so that you have to train every single day. There's no plan out there that exists to run seven marathons in a week. Can't imagine. All of the plans are for a marathon, and all of them say, after you run the marathon, don't run another marathon for four, three to four months. Don't get on an airplane within a day. Oh, wow. Help it, which we're going to, of course, shatter that. Sure. And get tremendous nutrition and plenty of rest for the next week after a marathon. And we're not doing any of those. So I called uh, a, a a track coach and asked him if he would train me and he was all for it sure i'd love to but he thought i was going to run it in january of 2017 and i'd have 15 months to train because that's more rational it is but right. you know we're in legislative session <laughs> january 17 so sure. i said man i got to do it in 16 and so he says oh well that's impossible and you'll die <laughs> <laughs> So, so words of encouragement from everywhere right. right i had to do it on my own what i did was i took two plans from the internet 
uh, two different training plans for a marathon. And I would just do the harder thing each day. So if this plan on day one had eight miles and this one had six, I do the eight. But then the next day, if this had 10 and this had eight, I do the 10. And you know, an amazing thing about when you put your body in motion, you become smaller, you lose weight, which makes it easier to go forward and to run. True. So that was nice. Right. And I started out at 235 running, you know, four miles and not even be able to run at all, have to walk some of it and then go back to, and then within your body reacts so quickly within five or six weeks, being able to run 10 miles flat. And, and, and it was wonderful, a great experience in that regard. Right. And my wife didn't mind the fact that I was getting skinnier. You were getting buff and, and thinner. Well, yeah. I wasn't net ever thin, but I was thinner. Yeah. <laughs> Point of order. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So what were you eating during this time? Do you have a special diet? I mean, just eat smarter, but not outrageous, uh, what right. I wanted to. But because when you're doing that kind of work, you don't want to blow it going to eat McDonald's. Right. So, you know, fast food was pretty much out. Sure. A um, lot, lot of chicken, more vegetables. But I still primarily ate similar things. But the other interesting thing is, so when you can work up to 15 miles right. or 17 miles, which some people would think, that's like, I would never do that. It's not as hard as you would think once you build up toward it. Right. But so 17 miles would t- probably take me roughly around three hours to, to run because you walk some of it. Right, you're just trying to build up and stamina, and you're still not up to the 26 miles, Correct. which is the mer- a marathon. Correct. Right. But once you run 17 miles, you get some somewhat nauseous. So your body is starving. <clears throat> You've just burned. For me, being that weight, uh, I'd burn about um, 2,500 calories. Almost a full pound of fat would right. be, just be gone, like burnt. That's amazing. And but you don't want to eat, so you force yourself to have a little bit. Right. So. At this point, did you reach out to Johnny's family and say, hey, I'm going to do this in, in his honor? Yes. So Jill McMillan, who was our friend and neighbor, who was kind of the conduit, reached out to them and told them, and they thought it was insane. And then my wife and I looked on the internet to find like a globe and the, the seven destinations we were going to. We found any and, uh, any and all facts we could and sent them to Johnny and Jackie yeah. so they could follow it. And, and you know, the, and the hope was that Johnny would be able to, you know, see us as we're going through it. Right. Unfortunately, in December, uh, almost exactly one year from his diagnosis, he passed away. Mm-hmm. And then we have, we're kind of thrown into a crisis of, do we bother continuing? Right. Sure. And it was because Johnny, the race at that point is how long away? Uh, it's going to start January 17th. Okay. Uh, well, at least to the process of going down there and then the race starts January 23rd. Right. But Johnny Wade's mother reached out to us and she said, I absolutely want you to continue because this is about honoring my son's memory and honoring his last and fulfilling his last wish, which is no other kid gets cancer. And as you and I know, almost 50 kids every day, every day. get diagnosed with cancer. And that's the leading cause of death amongst children. Right. And, you know, Johnny's right. No other, no kid should get cancer. They should be carefree and that's living right. a life. And, and think about the pain of the parents. You know, when you lose a spouse, they call you a widow or widower. Um, when you, um, you know, when you lose your parents, they call you an orphan. But there's no name because it's so god awful. If you lose a child, there's no name for that. Right. And uh, we just don't want any parents to have to go through that. Absolutely not. So you decided to forge ahead. So we forge ahead, and um, I've lo- um, at the end of the training, I was down. I lost about thirty pounds. Okay. And I remember feeling my stomach and it was so flat. It was so nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to get back to that. <laughs> and, and then I remember that. So what you do when you run a marathon, I didn't know any of this stuff. The last two weeks, you kind of taper down. Okay. And you don't train as hard. The hardest week I had training, I ran 102 miles. Because you never run at 26 miles. Even all the marathon plans have you going about 20 to 23. Really? Okay. Because there's really no need for it. Right. Um, and it just puts extra stress and strain on your joints and ligaments in your body right. and what have you. So uh, I did run one twenty three, but most of my long runs were 17 to 20. And then you tape, taper down. So the last run I'm going to have before I leave, a couple days before um, the plane takes off, January 16th, we're going to go down to Chile. And I ran, uh, I just want to run for an hour. When I started this thing, I couldn't run six miles in an hour. Sure. At that point, I could run eight. I remember running eight miles in an hour, an average of seven and a half minute miles. And I'm like, that's pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> I was shocked. I'll was take good. that. Hey, it was a good day. So you jump on a plane, you go to Chile on your way to Antarctica. 
you get there? When do you meet everybody else who's doing this? Yeah, we fly through Santiago, and which is obviously pretty far south, and then you go three hours further south to the southernmost city in the world, and it's just a fun name to say, Punta Arenas, Chile. <laughs> Where are you going? I'm going to Punta Arenas. Chile. And, and how, many, how many inhabitants are in this place? I, you know, Punta, it's, not, it's a medium-sized city, maybe 1,500,000, something like that. Okay. So uh, it's down right at the base, and the, a lot of mountain climbers go down there and anybody expeditions to Antarctica. So Antarctica, there is, we meet everybody there in Punta, and then we have some logistical stuff we have to go through, and then we're going to fly to Antarctica. Now, how do you get to Antarctica? There aren't any airplanes. Right. Or, I'm sorry, there aren't any airports. Airports, okay. Right. Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, highest, and driest of all the continents. The South Pole's at 9,000 feet in altitude. I did not know that. Obviously, North Pole's at sea level. And every 1,000 feet you go up, you lose 3 degrees. So that's why, consistently, Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth. Because mm-hmm. it's, you know, a polar, and you've got that altitude. The Russians back, the, in the Soviet Russians, back in the 70s, designed the Aleutian 76 aircraft which was to f- kind of reach out to remote parts of Siberia. It's perfect to land in Antarctica. Antarctica has predominant southern winds, so they, f- they naturally produce very flat surfaces off mountains. Right. Anyway, that's where it lands is a perfectly smooth ice runway. Nice. I, I was not enthused about getting on an aircraft built by, the so- by communists in 1970. Yeah, it's a little old. Yeah. They had four engines, so that gave me some solace. But when I walked on the plane and saw the, the life raft had last been inspected in September of 1992, <laughs> I kind of I kind of got a little panicky again. At, but, at this point, did you know you were going to land on an ice runway? Yeah, I knew uh, that. That was what I was worried most about. And the crew was flat out Ruskies. I mean, they were Russians from Russia. Yeah, makes sense. Deal. And they're flying it. And so I'm thinking about this. I'm on the plane. I'm going, you know, the last place I ever thought I'd find myself is being flown to a barren wasteland. Devoid of life. Flown by Russians. <laughs> what in the world? Yeah. But not, we land safely. Not on my bucket yeah, list. Right. Right. We land safely, get to Antarctica. It's gorgeous. It's pristine. It, uh, but we're in the interior, so there's no life. Okay. Penguins are on the coast. No life whatsoever. It's very quiet. Uh, when the wind's not blowing, and if you walk out outside of camp, it's absolutely peaceful. Mm-hmm. And Antarctica is also the only land on the planet that isn't a country. No sovereign state owns it. There's technically no law. Lawyers, no offense, would be out of work. Yes, it's, that's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in, a, we're in the tent. Our, our personal tents were unheated, so we had a sleeping bag like this thick. Oh, wow. double line tent. You become the heat. You don't to heat up, and you have to got to trap it. So it's very cold at first. But I'm, we're getting to meet all these people. Now, these other characters are, again, you can do a whole podcast just on them. They are, right. they are characters out of a novel. So one, from all over the world? All over the world. Right. One gal, an Australian, had cancer herself, survived it, and then got back and regained her health and strength and ended up running the and winning the North Pole Marathon a few years before. Another fellow had overcome addiction and now uh, had 295 marathons under his belt. Oh, wow. Two fellows were on the Marine Corps marathon team. And could could move, and they were twenty seven year olds. They were made of rubber, you know. <laughs> Hate those guys. <laughs> so I'm meeting all these wonderful and crazy folks, right? And this one gal, this German gal, Sarah, comes up to me, and she says, "Pat, I hear that you're new to running. You mean new to like ultra running, which is fifty kilometer races and hundred kilometer races, okay? Thirty miles, sixty right. miles, right? And I said, "Oh no, uh, I'm new to like." Uh, not 50 k's and 100 k. I'm new to 10 k's. <laughs> she just did not have process. You had that. never done a 10 k. No, no. Uh, and she walked away from me and didn't speak to me for three days. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing here? She thought I was. She, she thought joke. you were going to die too. Probably yes. in Antarctica. You got to be right. very careful. Um, so in Antarctica, they hear, they hear the rules. Number one, we're on a glacier, uh, 5,000 feet thick, and there are crevasses everywhere. So they have to check the, for some the, people say crevice. Yeah, crevasse, crevice, a hole that you don't tomato, want to fall Tomato, tomato. Yeah. If you fall in that hole, you ain't getting out. Ooh. It's Antarctica. There's no right. margin for error, literally. Right. And so they have to check everything for son- with sonar to make sure that there's real ice down there and it's thick. That's how they already checked the camp. So we have to run a six and a quarter mile loop, roughly, 
they check it with sonar mm -hmm. and they put little blue flags on each side. Mm -hmm. Suffice to say, when you run a marathon in Antarctica, do not cut corners. Ooh. Stay within the little blue flags. Okay. While we were down there, someone did die in camp because you have to be very careful. Not one of the 15 runners in the World Marathon Challenge, but someone else. Because if you get sick at all or you get exposed, you know, with the exposure to the cold, there's no facilities. Right. They cannot fly you out. The oh, next wow. plane was coming three days and you're just stuck there. Mm. So you have to be very careful. And uh, anyhow, so we, we are very careful and they tell us the rules. So in Antarctica, the other challenge is if you bundle up too much, you're going to sweat. And if you sweat, it will freeze. And if it freezes, you'll get hypothermia and you're going to die. Oh, geez. And the same, but on the same, on the uh, converse, conversely, if you have exposed skin, mm -hmm. you're going to get frostbite, frostbite and you're going to lose digits. You don't want to do that either. So that was a huge challenge. I didn't know it until about six months ago, somebody called and told me that I was uh, the first and still only person to ever do their first marathon on the continent of Antarctica. Oh, wow. And okay. I can tell you why. Because it's an extraordinarily bad idea <laughs> to do your first marathon on the continent of Antarctica. So I'm, I'm going to guess you weren't wearing those short, short little runner shorts? No. Yeah. Okay, no. good. But, you know, with technology, you do have some things um, that help you. And um, so I, I wore the, the wicking materials and, and, la and you layers. Right. I had four changes of clothes in the tent because we were doing a six and a quarter mile loop in case I got sweaty at all. I was going to go right into the tent, change out of it, okay. dry off, and put new clothes on. Okay. Fortunately, it didn't become necessary, but I didn't know at the time. Right. Anyhow, I have this plan about exactly what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. And as soon as you start running, plan's out the window. You're just, it's chaos. I didn't understand any of this. So I'm running. I can't see. And in Antarctica, you don't need polarized sunglasses or goggles. But if you don't have them on, you'll be blind in an hour. You lose Whoa. your sight. So you're, con I mean, you can take them off for a second, right? But pop them back on, but because of the thinness of the ozone layer and the power of the sun, it's a midnight sun, so it's uh, light all the time. Sure. Three in the morning look just like noon, so it shatters your internal clock, which wasn't all that bad of a thing. Right. Anyhow, we get started, and we we run, and uh, it was really tough because I ended up wearing sneakers and not the special shoes I had for Antarctica, because all the other runners told me if you haven't trained in those, don't run in them because you're probably going to get blisters, and then you won't be able to do the next six marathons. Oh, wow. So it was, a, it was tough. It was yin and yang, because I'm not getting the purchase that I would normally get. So at about mile 14, I was going to quit, because I had expended the energy that would have taken to otherwise have done a full 26-mile marathon. And I stopped. And I said, ah, there's just half a, half a marathon you know, option. I probably That's better suited for me. And I'm by myself. There's no one around me. And I did something that surprised me. I prayed. I just opened my arms up like this and, and just gave myself up to the Holy Spirit. And I said, I can't do this myself. Right. And I really honestly, Trey, felt the prayers of the thousands of people back home that were praying for me. And all the people that had donated money to the cause at that time, we'd raised about $70,000. Uh, and I felt that. And I said, you know, this isn't about me. Right. And I just felt this overwhelming warmth come over me. And I went from this valley of despair to being on this zenith in this mountaintop. Because like, oh, it'll be fine. Literally overnight, I, over in, a, in an instant. Instantaneous. Yeah. Like, oh, it'll be fine. Just go. And I wasn't worried about the next 12 miles. I was just, just concern yourself with the next step. Right. And what a metaphor for life, right? Oh, sure. So I just kept on. And long story short, 12 miles later, um, we finished. And I do have to have a sidebar story because... There was this guy from Japan named Masumaki, and we all called him Mikey. And he's just a character out of a novel. Before the race, we're having our last meal a couple hours before, and I sit down with Mikey, and he's eating the stereotypical Japanese meal. He's huh. got a mound of cucumbers. He's got lettuce and his carrots and his celery, and he's really thin already. And I got this stereotypical American meal. I got a pork chop, mashed potatoes, three rolls, and I felt guilty, but then I look and I go, wait a minute. He's already skinny. This isn't a 5K or a 10K. This is 26.2 miles. Right. And mile 24, where's Mikey going to get the energy? Sure. Because I have internal gel packs. <laughs> I'll be fine. I have a reserve. And, you know, so we, anyway, we, I, 
And lo and behold, no kidding. So you and didn't give him a roll or part of a pork chop? He wanted it. He <laughs> wanted it. But at mile 24, I started to catch him. I'm like almost dead last. Right. And I passed Mikey on mile 25. And as I run past him, I go, hey, hey, cucumber, here comes pork chop. <laughs> <laughs> we finish. I incredibly slow time. It took me five hours and 47 minutes to finish the first marathon. So were you last? No, I was 13th out of 15. Okay. Yeah, okay. believe it or not, I beat Ma- Mikey and Mikey. one other gal. Gotcha. One, one other gal. But then I'm a marathoner. I had done it. You know, I'd run my first marathon. I lived. No frostbite. All right. And we take a quick shower. I'd be ready to go home at that point. Well, yeah. Well, and then so the other thing that was awful is when you run a marathon, you're not going to feel like eating, but you have to because your body's starving. Sure. Very unhealthy not to. Right. Well, they had closed the kitchen because they were closing camp for the season. They have a, we, we had no food. And then we were going to get on the plane in two hours. And they'd asked us not to shower because they have to melt the snow and it's expensive. To, and I'm like, I'm showering. I showered. <laughs> it's a three-minute shower. you got a five-gallon bucket. Right, you got to melt it ice. I, it's a, another long story. But nonetheless, we did it and we're done. So we, then we fly. And we just for, for time's sake, I'll kind of run through two through six because I really want to focus and visit with you on what happened on the last marathon. Sure. We go to Punta Arenas, Chile, okay. about a four and a half hour flight. Right. We get there, we're starving. We have to go through customs, oddly enough. Oh, we wow. just left the place <laughs> that's barren of light. <laughs> All it has is ice. You weren't bringing back a plant. Oh, look, water. <laughs> you know, what do you think? Yeah, there's nothing to smuggle. Right. Anyway, we went through customs, it took an hour. And the buffet, the hotel had a buffet, and it was breakfast. Mm. breakfast. Mm. And they should have arrested us for what we did at that buffet. <laughs> I was like, excuse me, superpower coming through. You're right. We eat, uh, and then we got, that was the last time we were sl- we slept in a bed until marathon number six. Oh. We got about four hours sleep, and then we ran marathon number two in Punta on sidewalk right next to the Straits of Magellan. Pretty scenic oh, wow. view, particularly if you weren't have to doing 26.2 miles. That's right. I finished that one a full hour faster in four hours and 52 minutes because we're not on ice that helps yeah god it was so wonderful <laughs> and now uh, the tough part you got to get in a plane go through santiago we're going to miami to okay. run another one It was great to be back home in the states sure my wife came out and the wade family just lost their son three weeks prior flew from uh, st louis to miami and i met them at about mile 20 mm. for the first time in person as you may imagine, very uh, emotional moment. Oh, absolutely. One that I'll never, oh, see, I get, um, you can still feel it. Tune in next week for part two of Trey's interview with Texas State Representative Pat Fallon. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.